Okay, we're going to wrap up our discussion of the female reproductive system uh, and, and talk a little about conditions, some words, medical terms that will come into play also using some of the medical terms we've learned in our first video. Again, I'm going to remind you that um, uh, that there are there is some sensitive material that's involved in this video so make sure that um, that uh, you watch it in a place where you're not worried about who else is going to be able to be be viewing it because um, you never know what people's ideas or opinions might be so therefore it's probably a good idea to do this in a, in a place where you could watch this and watch this alone okay so that's just a little bit of a about of a, of a, a word to word to the wise before we get started so let's talk about some of these things First thing we want to talk about um, is called carcinoma of the cervix. And I'll be showing you some some uh, Im some images um, as we go on here. And carcinoma of the cervix, carcinoma we know means cancer. Um, it's not an uncommon cancer, but on the other hand, uh, cancer deaths uh, from carcinoma of the cervix are, seem to be a lot less. And the, there's one significant reason why that's, and that's simply because um, of a test called the Pap smear. Pap smear, which actually stands for Papa Nicolau smear, um, is basically what they do is they they take a scraping of the area of the cells from the cervix, the surface of the cervix, right around that little opening or that called cervical os. Os, as a medical term, means mouth. That's the area where that canal goes from the cervix inside the uterus, inside that that um, in uterine uterine cavity. Uh, they take some scrapings from there, you know, with a little spatula, and then they also take a brush or a, um, an applicator and put it up in that little os, that little hole, that little canal, and take some cells from there. And they take them, put them on a slide, and they send them away, and they look for any type of cancer change, changes that will occur. This usually starts around the time when, uh, you know, reproductive age, when females start to have uh, certain uh, sexual activity uh, up to a certain point in life when after that point it's probably not not beneficial to even uh, do a, a pap smear. Um, uh, and the thing that's uh, interesting about carcinoma of the cervix, though, and, the, and again, the pap smear, uh, if it's done on a regular basis, uh, is able to detect uh, problems with the cervix even before they become cancer. So these precancerous conditions or precancerous changes that they see in the cells of the cervix can be seen in females who have regular pap smears. If they don't have regular pap smears, they go a number of years without a pap smear, then that goes beside the wayside. You can't you, you won't be able to tell. However, if they have if a female has regular pap smears, you know, after they after they get to uh, you know uh, um, a, a reproductive age, then what happens is the chance of them ever dying of cervical cancer is exceptionally, exceptionally low. Good thing about cervical cancer, it seems like it takes a long time, a number of years to go from precancerous stages to cancerous stages. So therefore, on a regular pap smear, they usually catch it before it even gets so far advanced, okay? Which is a good thing. That way they could actually prevent the cancer from happening because they could actually take a sort of preemptive strike to do things before the cancer would become full blown. Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, a number of years ago, they actually came out with uh, a vaccine, uh, which is basically for the HPV virus, human papillomavirus. And what they really find and what they looked at cervical cancer is that almost all, if not all, cases of cervical cancer those females are, are positive. They do have exposure to the human papilloma virus. Okay? Uh, so as a result, they came up with this vaccine to try to prevent um, people from getting HPV. And by doing that, would hopefully down the road prevent cervical carcinoma. Um, and it was okay. There was a lot of controversy about it, whether it should be done or should not. Initially, they started with females, and they realized males, because there's other things that human papilloma virus may also cause besides cervical cancer, and as well as if males are contracting cervical or um, uh, human papilloma virus, they may um, spread it or, or provide it to uh, females by activity um, that that aren't vaccinated, and they may take the human papilloma virus and give it to females. So therefore, they recommend that males also have the HPV in a very young age, early on, you know, in adolescence and you know, and, and you know, teens and early 20s. You know, um, uh, the people who didn't like the virus say, well, you know what, uh, the, the thing about cervical cancer it takes a long time to develop, so. Uh, maybe just regular pap smears is all you need, which probably has some validity to it. But on the other hand, if you have an abnormal, you know, if, if if you could prevent the virus, then perhaps uh, or prevent the virus from taking hold in the body, perhaps you could prevent any things that might have to be done if you do have a suspicious pap smear, such as with a medical or surgical treatment for that. Um, so, you know, it goes both ways. Also, people who were against the vaccine said that. Um, uh, that the, the, it doesn't cover all the individual strains of human papillomavirus, which is also true. It's called a polyvalent 
polyvalent vaccine, which means it, it could hit multiple strains, doesn't hit them all. But the, the good point is it hits most of them that do cause cervical cancer. So that's that. There are a number of things. If that somebody does have um, uh, precancerous changes, they could either freeze off those cells by liquid nitrogen or burn them off with electrical spark or something like that. Or if it goes down through that canal, they could actually cut out a piece of tissue to take it out. Well, the good news is then people don't end up with a full-blown cervical cancer and it's easy to take care of. And I'll show you some images of that in a little bit. Cervicitis is just an inflammation of the cervix. And this is usually because of one of a number of different types of organisms. A common one that will cause a inflammation in the cervix is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea will cause a rip roaring uh, pus-like inf inflammation of the cervix and you'll actually see pus that will actually be coming out through that cervical loss. You collect the pus inside the uterine cavity and it may leak out through that cervical loss. Other things that may do it, um, one thing, a certain yeast yeast infections. Uh, females, when they sometimes take an antibiotic, they develop a yeast infection, okay? And the reason why is there are certain bacteria inside the vagina that keep the vaginal health stable. And when they take the, take the antibiotic, it sometimes wipes out the bacteria. And as a result, the yeast are sitting there saying, hey, I can't be taken care of with an antibiotic. So I'm here all by myself. There's nobody home. Let's just go ahead and have a party. And more and more yeast develop. It takes over the area of the cervix. And they get this, uh, this uh, yellowish to whitish uh, curdly looking dis charge that will be from the cervix, okay? And that's just another reason why someone has a cervix size. Another one is um, a certain uh, protozoan uh, that's it's, it's called uh, 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 trichomonas, okay? And trichomonas, uh, not trichinosis, but trichomonas, looks like a little white blood cell with a tail with a little flagella, which is a little whip-like thing that swims around. And again, it's given, uh, females will get a really f sort of a frothy, bubbly, very strong, fishy, a bad fishy smelling type of a discharge uh, with that. Um, usually exceptionally itchy in the area of the vulva region. Uh, it can be spread to males. Okay, or it's usually, it will be spread. This protozoan, this little bug, is then spread to the male, any, any male context. Males are asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms. So they don't even know if they have it. So therefore what happens is even if you treat the female, then what happens is the male gives it back to the female next time they have any type of relationships. So anyway, um, uh, it's, they, they treat both par partners. So cervicitis basically could be from a number of different reasons, either bacteria, uh, uh, yeast, um, protozoans, and stuff like that that cause an irritation or inflammation of the cervix. Okay, Carcinoma of the endometrium. Endometrium, we you know, is the inside lining of the uterus. Um, this is a uterine cancer, okay? Uh, a lot of times it's, a, it's caused because, again, that, that endometrium, like we talked about in a previous uh, PowerPoint video, gets thicker and thicker and thicker without being sloughed off, such as with menses, okay? And as a result, the, the thicker that the wall gets, the more likely some of those cells are going to be uh, produ uh, be uh, prompted to change into cancerous cells. So as a result, this results in carcinoma of the endometrium, which usually re requires a hysterectomy. Okay, um, that's that. That's why again they, like I mentioned in my last video, a lot of times in the past, where they used to use, where they used to think a lot of hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal females to try to control the symptoms, the hot flashes, and then vaginal drying and stuff like that. They sort of backed off a little bit on that, or actually modified it a little bit, so that what happened. Therefore, they don't keep on making an increased thickness the wall of the endometrium without have it having sloughed. So that's what it is. So and carcinoma of the endometrium is a uterine cancer that involves the inside wall. Endometriosis is an exceptionally common condition. In fact, somebody in the class may have endometriosis, and usually every class has somebody with endometriosis. And what happens is um, the biggest complaint is there's usually exceptionally painful menses. Uh, sometimes the menses are a little bit unusual. They're not very typical as they would normally be. Uh, and the, what, what really happens is menses occurs, again, because the endometrial wall gets so thick, and then finally, if there's no pregnancy, um, the processes allow that endometrial wall to be sloughed removed and, and shed, and it's expelled with, 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 with blood uh, vaginally, okay, which is going to be the menses. Some people actually think that what might happen, what it might be the cause of this, is some of the endometrial tissue, instead of being expelled through the cervix and out the vagina, actually may have gone up and squirted out through the area of the fallopian tubes. Therefore, some of this endometrial tissue, instead of dying and just being lost, okay, um, ends up uh, attaching to the wall of the intestine or inside the fallopian tube or somewhere where it's not supposed to be. As a result, it 
causes continual problems. In other words, when somebody has it gets to, their, their, to the time when they're going to have a menstrual menses, what we'll find is they some the menses are bad. Why? Because it's not just the inside of the area of the uterus that's having this problem that they're trying to slough, but other areas inside the abdominal cavity and stuff like that are having this endometrial tissue that's building up and it's being lost a little bit, but it's causing irritation in multiple other places. Um, and uh, females with endometriosis um, can get pregnant, but sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for them to get pregnant. Sometimes they have to try a little bit more, uh, or there has to be a little bit, um, uh, it's more difficult, let me put it this way, in many cases, for that, that to occur. It's a not uncommon um, thing to see. Uh, usually what happens is when, peop when females do have endometriosis, because sometimes there's so many little places in the abdomen with all this endometrial tissue, which should be endo within the uterus, but it's inside the abdominal cavity, you can't get to it. You can't scrape it out. I mean, you could go in, sometimes they could burn it out, you know, through a laparoscopic surgery. But on the other hand, it's sometimes could be quite extensive and they could do, and, and it's really not possible to totally control it. The way they usually control that is they don't really control the endometrium a whole lot. Um, but what they do uh, by taking it out, what they do is they usually control it by birth control pills. And the birth control, what a birth control pill does, and this is sort of interesting, a birth control pills are estrogen and estrogen progesterone combination pills. What they do is instead of having the estrogen uh, rise and then fall like it does, and that fall produces the menses, it keeps a constant level of the estrogen, a very low level, but a constant level, and actually can Confuses the brain to think that, that she's pregnant when she's really not. So therefore, it prevents pregnancy because what happens is then then that it, it shuts off that FSH that comes from the brain that actually stimulates the development of a follicle and an ovum. So it stops the process at the at step one by confusing the brain to think that she's pregnant and she can't get pregnant on top of being pregnant because it stops off those pituitary hormones like we talked about last time. And so, so birth control pills uh, sometimes will actually help to decrease the symptoms. Females who are on birth control pills usually recognize that either they don't have much of a menses, if any menses at all, and if they do, it's very, very scanty, very small. Okay, so that's endometriosis, a common problem, not fatal, not not cancerous or anything like that, but it is pain and sometimes does make pregnancy a little bit more difficult. Uterine fibroids are tumors that occur inside the wall of the uterus. The, the wall, they get these large uh, masses that will form inside there. They're rarely, rarely, rarely cancerous, okay? Sometimes the, they're, they're actually called lyomyomas. Lyomyomas, that means smooth muscle tumor, okay? Oma tumor, lyo, lyomyo, smooth muscle. And uh, they, they get large. They could be the size of like basketballs or watermelons. They could actually get really, really, really big. Uh, again, very rarely do they change to become cancer. Um, they become, sometimes they become a lyomyosarcomas, which is, but it's, it's a very low incidence. What they do is they create, they sometimes in a, a childbearing age, they actually may decrease the ability to become pres pregnant because sometimes it, it, it sort of like obliterates the whole uterine cavity inside the uterus. It obliterates it so there's no place for, for, for a fetus to go or it blocks up the, uh, uh, the inrush of, of spermatozoa. So that's what we see where the uterine fibroid, they can be surgically taken out if they need to be taken out if they're symptomatic or if they do cause a problem. A lot of times the biggest problem is they cause some pelvic uh, heaviness. You know, they feel like a real heaviness in, in the pelvic region. And when they do an exam, they could feel these lumps and bumps on the uh, uterus, which they see with the uterine fibroids. Let's look at some of these. If you look up in the upper left, okay, uh, that's the cervical carcinoma. If you look, that's a speculum that you see that metal area is a speculum. And you're able to actually see that the, 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 the cervix. If, I, if I'm looking at, at this picture here, let me try, I think it's not working at all. I'm not getting much at all. Okay. If I look at this, at the cervix, I can't, my, my pointer's not working at all. But if I look at the cervix, that's the thing right in the middle. And you can actually see there's a lumpy, bumpy area. And around that hole in the center, there's a shiny area. It looks like it's something shining straight back. And there's a little reddish area just down to the below it and to the right. Well, just below that shiny area, there's like a little small, like a V. That's the area where the opening would be into the uterus. That's that cervical os. And right there, you see that mass just on top, as well as all the abnormal cells, those brownish cells. They could actually stain them with iodine to see where those where those masses come out and that's what they see with the cervical carcinoma in those situations if it's really extensive then it's going to be hysterectomy they'll do that if it's a very small very localized sometimes they could actually take it out what's called a cervical cone and i'll show you that about some pre procedures later on if you look up in the upper right that's a cervicitis and you can look there's the cervical os that that instead of being a hole sort of like a slit 
this is a multiparous cervix. In a, in a female who's not had a child, usually the cervical os is round. In this case, it's like a slit. Why? Because it's been stretched out and changed according to uh, a, a, a head coming down there, a fetal head coming down there. And you can actually see that stuff that's dripping out from the, 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 the right side. That's just a lot of pus. You know, it's pus that's dripping out over the cervix. The a picture on the lower left are actually uterine fibroids, okay? And that's the uterus. The bottom part is the uterus. You can see the uterus at the very bottom, okay? And uh, uh, all those lumps on the top, that's all the fibroids. And again, they're re they could be really, really humongous and, and large. So those are uterine fibroids. A couple things about the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Ovarian carcinoma. Um, I really hate to talk about ovarian carcinoma, and it, and, but it, it has to be mentioned. Uh, again, car cancer of the, of the of the ovaries, um, it probably is as aggressive. It's hard to say aggressive, but it's it's not that much different from cancer of the testicle in males. Here's the difference: in males, you could feel the testicles. Okay, and males should be doing testicular examinations on themselves on a regular basis. Okay, Young, younger males, you can't really feel the ovaries very well. So the problem that makes ovarian carcinoma so dangerous is usually by the time symptoms have developed that show ovarian carcinoma, it's frequently well advanced, which means it's past the point of no return. Okay, and that's one of the problems with ovarian carcinoma. Um, it occurs at all ages, younger females, older, middle-aged females, uh, um, childbearing age females, all kinds of females. So there's really not as much of an age limit in there. But it's basically a cancer of the ovaries, um, and again, which is highly lethal simply because by the time of detection, when it finally causes symptoms that make a difference, um, it's usually pretty well advanced, okay? There are some lab tests which may point towards it. However, those aren't usually routinely done on people. So as a result, it goes undetected until it creates symptoms, and when it's symptoms, then it's causing a problem. Ovarian cysts are a little bit different. Ovarian cysts, they actually think might happen. So when we go back to our first talk, when we talked about the follicles, and the follicles start out small, and then underneath that follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, the follicles start to grow and get bigger. Well, sometimes they think what happens is the follicle might be there, but maybe the ovum is not. Okay, so in other words, there wasn't really an ovum inside there. So that follicle fills with fluid, and a, and it's a fluid filled mass, a fluid filled sac, is called a cyst. Okay. Now the problem with these is sometimes these cysts may rupture, they may rip, uh, and that may cause some problem. They may bleed, stuff like that. Uh, a couple also things about they find about ovarian cysts is uh, females with ovarian cysts have a tendency to have a higher than normal estrogen level. Okay, and because they have that higher than normal estrogen level that also sometimes makes getting pregnant more difficult. Why? Because again, if that estrogen is high, level is high, a constant high level instead of that peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs with every month, because that estrogen level is high, um, we also find that what happens is it feedbacks to the brain and it stops that pituitary from putting out that FSH and therefore it might make pregnancy more difficult. Also, in females with ovarian cysts, one of the common things that we find besides that that also decreases pregnancy, okay, the chance of pregnancy, is that what happens if I have higher levels of estrogen, some of that estrogen is then converted to, did I hear it? Did I hear it? Yep, testosterone. And that testosterone negatively feedback, feeds back and says, yep, nope, can't get pregnant, okay, can't get pregnant, can't get pregnant. So that testosterone means that the pituitary is not going to also make that FSH and LH. Also, what happens is because the testosterone level in females with ovarian cysts goes up, one of the things that we frequently see is they develop facial hair. That development of facial hair in females is called hirsutism, H-I-R-S-U-I-T-I-S-M, hirsutism. So that's because of the higher level of testosterone, because there's a higher level of estrogen, because of the ovarian, that actually was probably maybe one of the reasons why they have the ovarian cysts. Pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, is something where when we looked at that cervicitis before and you could see that pus leaking out, well the pus is coming out the cervical os. If the pus fills that endometrial cavity, that 
uterine cavity inside, that pus then could go out the fallopian tubes. And when it goes out the fallopian tubes, it starts to drip down the end of the fallopian tubes because it's open right where the ovary is. It drips down. And where does it drop? It right drops down that cul-de-sac like we talked about, that little area between the rectum and the uterus, behind the uterus and in front of the rectum that we showed in, a, in our previous um, um, about my video PowerPoint, okay, and uh, it causes a rip roar and inflammation of the of the peritoneum. Everybody should know what the peritoneum is, and therefore treating with antibiotics and all kinds of stuff has to be done. Okay. Now this is a picture of an ovarian cyst, okay, and this is it looks should be an ovary, but you see all those little bubbles on there? Those are all the cysts. This is called polycystic ovaries, okay. Now sometimes if it's one cyst, it probably doesn't make a difference. In fact, a lot of people may have a females may have a, uh, have an ovarian cyst. It'll never cause a problem. They never know they have it, and and unless they have an autopsy at the time of death when they're however old, they may never know it. However, this is polycystic ovary disease, and that's when the estrogen levels are high. When we have a lot of these cysts, usually with one cyst, it's not a problem. It's just one of those things that happen. However, and people and females with this polycystic ovary disease, okay, that's when the estrogen levels are high. That's when the testosterone levels are high. That's when it's much more difficult to get pregnant if they have multiple cysts. And because they, and the reason why they have multiple multiple cysts is because there's probably some problem in their controlling of their estrogen. Estrogen levels are always high, okay. And that's just a polycystic ovary. And then this is multiple cysts. This is the pelvic inflammatory disease, and you can actually see on this image right here, you see where the where the vagina is at the bottom. So bacteria may enter the vagina with semen, okay, uh, during uh, uh, intercourse. And then what happens is that all moves up the area through that area, that cervical os, that opening, up that canal inside that, in, that uterine, uterine cavity, okay? So the bacteria goes through the cervix and enters the inside that cavity inside the uterus. And what happens is then the, the pus and the bacteria work their way out through the fallopian tubes, and then some Sometimes we'll actually flip out the end of the fallopian tubes as we see at number four there and fall in that cul-de-sac in the area of the peritoneal cavity, okay, which then is a really big problem. Now I get infection inside the whole abdomen, you know. So that's a little about pelvic inflammatory disease. A couple things about the breast. Uh, carcinoma of the breast, uh, still an exceptionally common cancer. Hopefully the, 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 the death rates are, are falling and almost every family uh, knows somebody that um, has had uh, breast cancer. Uh, my wife's mother died from a recurrent breast cancer and her grandmother had bilateral mastectomies because of it. Okay, so it's always a concern on our minds. But um, everybody probably knows someone with a breast cancer and maybe a family member, maybe even a close family member, which you know, then you have my, my condolences. But what happens is the thing about breast cancer is it, it's it's exceptionally common. It's rare before the age of 40, usually after 40. That's why they don't start doing mammograms until about 40 years of age. Mammograms will help to look to detect this by taking an X-ray of the of the breast, and they take the breast and squish it between two plates. Yes, squish it between plates. Yes, squish it between two plates. Take an X-ray through there, and they're looking for changes in density that show that there might be a mass. A couple things that are interesting about breast cancer is people think when something's painful, it's worse. Most breast cancers are non-painful. They're painless, a painless mass in the breast. Usually, a lot of times, females will get masses in the breast that feel like little nodules or little like golf balls or little marbles uh, or little bubbles, okay? And this is something else. This is either called fibrocystic disease, which is below that, or fibroadenomas, which is also another thing. Those are both benign. Those are both normal, okay? Not normal, but they're both benign. Sometimes they're worse at the time of menses because, or during, uh, or, or just before menses when the estrogen levels are a certain level and stuff like that. Um, but what happens is, is uh, carcinoma of the breast sort of is, sits there because, and you, and you don't really know much is going on. Why? Because it's a painless mass. You don't feel a lump to start out with. What usually is you feel a hard spot. If you feel one of these lumps from the fibrocystic disease or fibroadenomas, you can feel the edges. It feels smooth around the edges. That's not the case with a carcinoma of the breast. In carcinoma of the breast, you can't feel the edges. It's just a hard area. And sometimes it's hard and actually pulls the skin back and it causes what's called a dimpling. They'll look at the breast and there'll be a little dimpled area in that area of the breast where the skin has been pulled back from the from the mass, okay? Um, also, sometimes the, the thing about carcinoma of the breast, when it does occur, it frequently spreads from the breast to the area of the axilla, the armpit, which then causes the lymph nodes in the armpit to have what's called metastatic changes 
in the in the in those lymph nodes because that cancer is being spread to the lymph nodes. Okay, um, so a lot of times they will look they'll, they'll, they'll always look at the at the lymph nodes in someone with a carcinoma of the breast. They can do all kinds of different biopsies. Um, the, the the procedures to surgically do it have gone from radical mastectomy years ago to uh, simple mastectomy to segmental mastectomies, and and the philosophy is different according to different surgeons as well as the size of the lesion, the location of the lesion, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that can be done. What's the biggest uh, thing about this? Number one, if there's a family history of breast cancer, uh, surveillance is important, is very important. Not saying that if you don't have a family history, you're free, because it's not the case. You know, the numbers of, breast, of, of people with breast cancers is actually quite high. The percentage is actually very, very high. But again, um, after the age of about 40, uh, or earlier, if you do have a, a very strong uh, family history, the other thing is called uh, the Gale predictive model, where they actually plug in a number of, uh, put, a, put a bunch of things into numbers, and they come up with a score. And if that score is above a certain thing, it means your incidence is quite high. Okay, uh, they could do that. Um, but uh, also, um, there are a couple um, uh, genetic tests that they that they that they've been doing. Okay, and there's actually more and more developed all the time. We're getting more and more into looking at genes as to how we could make a diagnosis diagnosis of something. But for years, some two of the tests that were there were what are called BRCA1 and BRCA2. And BRCA stands for BR breast, CA stands for cancer, even though these, these genes could be changed in other types of cancers. But they frequently looked at them for, for cancer of the breast, and they were frequently abnormal if, in, in certain individuals who have genetic tendency. What happens is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes we all have. And what they do is these genes actually are there to either repair or destroy tissue issues that are going bad, okay? These these two genes uh, control body processes. If something is a bad um, change in a cell or a, quote, mutation that may go towards a cancer, um, these, these genes produce proteins that will actually either try to repair it, if it can be repaired, and if it can't be repaired, it'll destroy it. Here's the problem. What happens is BRCA1 and BRCA and or BRCA2 gene has been um, if it has been mutated, and there's a, probably 150 to 200 different mutations of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, okay? And, if the mut and certain mutations actually suggest that these BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes don't produce correct proteins that allow for either repair or destruction of abnormal cells, which allow those abnormal cells, if they're there, instead of being repaired by the proteins from BRCA1, BRCA2, or destroyed, they aren't, and they're allowed to survive. Okay, so as a result, that's the biggest thing. That's one of the things that I talked about. We have a friend whose daughter uh, had a very small mass, very very small mass, and um, very isolated. But when they did genetic testing on on her, she was um, uh, she had a positive or uh, or detrimental mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, and actually at that time, at a very young age, decided to have bilateral mastectomies because her instance of having breast cancer would be so high down the road. Okay, so that's a little about breast cancer. Uh, fibrocystic disease is basically uh, something that's not uncommon, and it's basically what it says: fibrous and cysts. So what happens is there'll be little areas. Usually they're up and towards the outer portion. There's a little area up towards that goes up towards the top of the shoulder in front of the axle. This little fold here and that's called the tail of Spence and a lot of times we find them in there but they could be in multiple places in the in, in the breast and they become very tender they little, little, little tender cysts um, they could put a needle in there if they draw some fluid out it's a cyst that's probably going to be benign but the fibrocystic disease is definitely a benign type of a disease this is just looking and I just threw this in here for your own information about some of the breast cancer uh, breast cancer symptoms you know a texture change in the breast uh, some dimpling which is that little pulling back of, of the tissue, uh, sometimes some uh, discharge from the area of the nipple, uh, sometimes a lump, but that lump doesn't have regular edges to it. Uh, sometimes the nipple gets pulled back, called a nipple inversion, okay? Uh, uh, lumps in the armpit that may be because the cancer is spread from the breast to the area of the armpit or the axillary region, and then also uh, sometimes a redness or even a rash in that area, or sometimes the breast when in very advanced cancers will swell, and it looks like a peel of an orange. You'll see those little holes, which are basically all the little hair follicles, and there, and because the tissues around swell, it, it's called a pota orange or orange peeling, and it looks like there's little little dents all over the place because the, the breast has been swell, swollen. And the picture on the right just shows, you know, I, 
if you see there's a little mass in there, just, just sort of like about 10 o'clock from the nipple. And basically it starts there. Then we know stage two, it's getting larger. In stage three, what happens is that mass is now leaving the breast and it's going along that lymphatic channel. And you see how it's going along the lymphatic channel towards the armpit. And then and, and they'll start to find some nodes in the axillary region that might be positive. And then stage four means it's going to other organs and other tissues throughout the body, which is a, what's called distant metastasis. So that's a little bit about breast. A couple pathologic uh, pregnancy terms, abruptio placenta. This is not an uncommon situation, and abruptio placenta is just what it sounds like. The placenta stays attached, okay? And, at the, and in fact, what happens is that the, after, at the time of delivery, the baby's delivered, okay? The cord's cut, and then they take the cord and they sort of like roll it up like a, like, like pasta on a, on a, on a fork. And, they, and, and what will happen is the abdomen will continue to contra contract and there will be a huge gush of blood. And that huge gush of blood is when the placenta rips away from the uterine wall and then they deliver the placenta. So that usually happens after the baby's born. What happens though in abruptio placenta, the placenta starts to separate from the uterine wall well before the baby's even going into labor. Okay, earlier in pregnancy. What this then causes is during pregnancy, there should be no uterine bleeding. Why? Because uterine bleeding or the menses is because the inside surface of the, of the uterus is being sloughed because there's no pregnancy. So therefore, during pregnancy, there's no menses. However, if a female starts, is pregnant, starts to develop bleeding during that pregnancy, it may be an abruptio placenta, where that placenta is starting to tear away from the wall. A lot of times what they do is just put a, put a female at rest and to try to slow that down. Hopefully, in most cases it works, it slows it down, and then carry the baby to full term, okay? But it, sometimes it might require an emergency C-section to be able to get the baby if, if the placenta is totally away. Once the placenta is away from the uterine wall, you know, and during pregnancy, guess what? There's no lifeline between the mom and the baby, and the, um, the baby's not getting any nutrients, oxygen, and it's going to be, you know, um, a demise of, of, of the fetus, okay? So that's abruptio placenta. So it's going to be bleeding that's occurring during pregnancy that says that the placenta may be ripping away from the abdominal wall, okay? Choriocarcinoma. I mentioned before that what happens is once the baby is delivered, Okay, the placenta comes. They always check the placenta, make sure all the placenta comes. It's a, it's a, it's a, a big glob of tissue that has a sac that's around it. Usually, that sac or that membrane around it will be ripped a little bit, but they all the all the placental tissue should be there. If it's not, some of that placental tissue stays in there, which is part of that original chorion, as we talked about in our last lecture. And this actually starts to grow. When it starts to grow and it shouldn't be there, all of a sudden it results in what's called a choriocarcinoma, a choriocarcinoma, which is a cancer. Usually these are relatively treatable. They can be treatable by excision, taken out, whether it be just that, usually a hysterectomy and, and chemotherapy, and it usually works pretty well. But that's choriocarcinoma, or sometimes it can be taken out, just that mass, and then put and then females if they if they don't have to do a hysterectomy, which is sometimes the case, um, then what they do is they put them on birth control pills for a couple of years. Because if 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 after a couple of years, uh, how do I know that the chorion is there? They know that the chorion is staying there because they still see that HCG human chorionic gonadotropin showing up in the urine. So if a person's not pregnant, okay. Okay, uh, and they prevent pregnancy by birth control pills. What happens is that HCG levels should be absent. There shouldn't be any. However, if after they do the surgery for the choriocarcinoma, the HCG levels go up, and they're taking birth control pills, and they know that they can't be pregnant, it has to be because of recurrence of the choriocarcinoma. So anyway, that's just a choriocarcinoma. It's just a cancer that occurs inside the uterus from remnants of the chorionic tissue that stays. Uh, the resemblance of a placenta, the lining of the placenta with the chorion uh, after birth. Ectopic pregnancy is a situation where we know that what happens is that pregnancy should be occurring uh, and the, the, the fetus should be developing inside the, inside the uterine cavity. Okay. Sometimes what happens is the, that fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube almost always. Okay. It's up in the fallopian tube and that fertilized ovum, that zygote, tumbles down and sticks to the wall of the uterus. Sometimes it doesn't make it. Sometimes that fertilized ovum sits up in the fallopian tubes and stops. Or sometimes it even goes the other way, which is less common, but usually it sticks in the fallopian tube. What happens is then that chorion attaches to the inside of the fallopian tube and the embryo or the, the zygote continues to get larger and it starts to become embryonic. Well, pregnancy tests are positive. Why? 
because that chorion is still there producing that HCG. It's getting in the blood and it's getting in the urine, so that's a positive pregnancy test. Here's the problem. All ectopic pregnancies are non-viable. They will all spontaneously abort because they outsize the container that they're in. And sometimes what they do is they get what's called a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, where what happens, it gets to a certain point where they start to get abdominal pain, bleeding, and stuff like that, because what happens is now that, um, that embryo that's in the fallopian tube that shouldn't be there, should be in the uterus developing, is, is basically dead, okay? And it causes a rupture around that area of the fallopian tube, which can and may be fatal because of bleeding, okay? So that's why they keep an eye on the, and people with ectopic pregnancies to make sure the pregnancy is going good. If someone is suspected of having an ectopic pregnancy, all they need to do is they do an ultrasound, and if they look at the inside of the uterine cavity, if they see a fetus, or if they see an embryo in there, or what's called a yolk sac, it's okay. However, if they don't, then they have to look at the fallopian tube, and chances are they're going to find it, find that in the fallopian tube, at which time they have to go in and evacuate the fallopian tube of the embryonic contents because it's going to cause a problem. It's going to rupture sooner or later, and the, and the baby will be non-viable one way. It's never going to get to a certain size. It's always going to be, as an embryo, very small. It's going to, it's going to eventually abort, okay? So that's called an ectopic pregnancy. Placenta previa, when the um, fertilized ovum the zygote gets to the uterine cavity, it sticks to the wall, up almost right where the fallopian tube is, very high in the wall of the uterus. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it sort of slides down the wall. It gets down to the bottom and it blocks that cervical os or that canal. And that's called a placenta previa. So guess what? When the baby's trying to come down the down the birth canal, what's in its way? The placenta. The placenta is blocking the outlet. So every time the baby's the, the uterine contractions are pushing, it's pushing the baby's head against the placenta, which decreases the blood supply to the umbilical cord to the baby. Okay, so it could be a problem. Uh, placenta previous because the out the birth canal is blocked by the placenta that sits in the way. Basically, what they have to do is they have to do a cesarean section. They'll take the baby by C-section. Okay, That's the placenta previa. Preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is something that's also very common in pregnant females. And what happens is um, uh, they think that the preeclampsia might be some type of an immune-related response to the what are called products of conception, whether it be the uh, chorion, the placenta, whatever the case may be. And the body looks at these as saying, hmm, should that really be here or not? And what it does, it starts to create some abnormal things. And one thing it causes, is it causes a lot of protein to be lost in the urine. Now, we talked about this in the, in the, in the urinary section. Protein is a big molecule, and we very should have almost no protein, if any protein at all, in the urine. All of a sudden, in pregnant females, if they start to show protein in the urine, they start to show some ankle swelling because they're losing the protein that holds the fluid in the blood, and all of a sudden their blood pressure starts to go up. This is called preeclampsia. This becomes an exceptionally dangerous situation. It's not uncommon. It should be. It needs to be managed. It can't control the blood pressure usually with medication because it's that's it's it's not because of con the the vessel size. It's because of this uh, re response against the products of conception. Okay, um, so they have to watch the female very carefully so there's no real treatment for it there's nothing they could do to treat it the only thing that will help this is delivering the child so what they'll do is in a female who's having preeclampsia the biggest risk is if the blood pressure keeps on going up and up and up and up and up and up and up it gets so high that they may have a stroke Okay, and they don't want those females to have a stroke. Obviously, it may blow, the pressure might be so high to blow out a vessel inside the brain, so they end up with this stroke. Nothing that they want to have happen. So, uh, what, uh, also, preeclampsia, when it gets to what's called eclampsia, because pre means before, eclampsia, they used to call this uh, a toxemia of pregnancy. So, if you talk to a grandparent or a parent, they may say, oh, yeah, it's called toxemia pregnancy. Well, the medical term is preeclampsia, not toxemia, but they called it toxemia. Uh, but when they get to this eclampsia, uh, what's besides what's called a malignant hypertension, the hypertension just going and uncontrollable and exceptionally high. They also have a situation where they're more likely to develop seizures.
fractures and convulsions, which then becomes a risk to both the mom and the baby. So it becomes a problem. So what they do is they monitor the mother to keep the, and sometimes even by hospitalization, to keep the blood pressure so that that, uh, that they're not at risk of, ha and they can't, again, they can't, it's very difficult. You can't treat the blood pressure with normal blood pressure medications, but they'll watch the mom to try to make sure that the blood pressure is not going too high and, and make sure she doesn't have seizures. And then as soon as the baby looks like it's uh, physically ready to be able to be born, they try to induce the, 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 the delivery at that time. And once the baby is delivered, uh, mom could still have pre could have toxemia afterwards, but then the incidence goes down. At least then it's not a risk, at least to the baby. Okay, and that's called uh, preeclampsia. Okay. Uh, this is just an ectopic pregnancy. And what happens is if we look at the picture on the left, you see how the fertilized uh, ovum with the zygote is attached to the wall of the uterus. On the other hand, if you look at the right, what happens is that fertilized ovum, that zygote, stays inside the fallopian tube and continues to grow. Okay, And that's a problem because it's not going to last. It's going to eventually out, out, outsize its compartment. It's going to rupture. If I look at the image on the um, on the right, you can see the top of the uterus. You see the top of the uterus. I put a little, I, I made a marker in that says uterus on the top of the uterus. Okay, this is looking with a with a scope, looking inside the abdomen. And if you look at the fallopian tube on the left side of that image, which would be the right fallopian tube, that's that ectopic pregnancy. That's a an embryo that's growing inside there that's gotten to a certain point that it's on the verge of rupturing. Okay, and when it does rupture, it can be fatal to both the mom and the baby's not viable anyway. Or the, I can't say baby has not got to that point. The embryo embryo is not viable anyway. Okay, so that's what we call an ectopic pregnancy. So that's important to know. A couple of neo neo neonatal neo uh, terms, uh, APGAR score. When the baby's born, what they do is they evaluate the baby on a number of five different characteristics and they score the baby according to their breathing, their cardio, their, their heart rate, uh, their aggressiveness, their cry, all kinds of different things. And they are able to evaluate the baby as to how uh, how the baby's making the transition from an intrauterine environment inside the uterus to outside. And it's called an APGAR score. They do an APGAR score at one minute, they do it at five minutes, okay? Five and one, okay, one and five. And usually what happens is most kids do well. The lower the APGAR score, the more likely they're gonna have to resuscitate the baby. More likely there's gonna be some problems. Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a genetic problem. They can actually tell by an amniocentesis and other things. They can actually do some ultrasound now and, and do a couple of other other proteins that they can measure in the blood, the maternal blood, to be able to, or to, and also in the amniotic fluid, to determine um, if there's a possibility of Down syndrome. What Down syndrome is, okay, and everybody's probably known somebody with Down syndrome or a family with Down syndrome. And what happens is we know we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. However, in the 21st pair, Instead of having two, there are three. It's called a 20, 21 trisomy. There's three chromosomes instead of two, and this is associated with Down syndrome. Erythroblastosis fetalis is something that um, that has, should deserve some consideration. Um, what happens is uh, there, when we look at our blood types, we have like A, B, A, B, or A, B, A, B, and O. But we also have either what are called positive or negative. Okay. AB positive means that positive means there's the thing that's called the RH factor. If you have the RH factor, which is a protein on the surface of the blood, you're RH positive. If you don't have an RH factor, you're RH negative. So what happens is the baby's blood could either be a positive or negative because it's a mixture of both dad's gen genes and mom's genes, and it could be a, a positive or a negative, okay? What happens is that maternal and that fetal circulation don't mix. They don't mix. Okay, so what happens is is when the baby's in the uterus, uh, there's nothing except nutrients and oxygen that get across this membrane between the placenta and the inside wall of the uterus. However, at the time of delivery, when the uterus, when the when the placenta rips away with fetal blood, it mixes with maternal blood. Okay, now if the mom is an Rh negative, that's a concern. That's a concern. That's a concern if the mom's an Rh negative. Why? Because if the baby is an Rh positive, that Rh positive blood now gets exposed to mom's Rh negative blood in the circulation. And all of a sudden the body says, hmm, that positive shouldn't be there. That's a bad cell. And it creates an antibody against Rh positive, against the Rh factor, okay? Not a problem with the first kid. First kid's out, he's in the incubator, he's ready, he's, he's back there, you know, he's ready to go. However, in the second baby, with the mom's B 
that placental, again, the mom's blood is separate from the baby's blood. However, certain things can go across. And certain things called immunoglobulins and things like that are small enough to go across the membrane, the placental membrane, to provide um, the baby with some additional help, some uh, immune-related help from the mom. However, the antibodies against the Rh positive factor, okay, Rh factor, actually could go through that placental membrane and it gets into the fetal circulation. If it gets into the fetal or the embryonic circulation, these antibodies destroy the blood of the baby, and the baby may be spontaneously aborted. Okay, so what's the what's the solution to this? Okay, because I know there's a lot of females who are Rh negative. My, my wife's an Rh negative. What happens is around the time of delivery, they could give a drug called Rogam, and this Rogam actually stops that reaction to make antibodies against the Rh factor. Okay, so what happens if someone's an R, if a female's Rh negative, they always test her blood. If she's an Rh negative, they give her the medication to stop that reaction occurring. So this erythroblastosis fetalis doesn't occur. Highland membrane disease. What happens is in inside the lung, they always talk about the lungs being mature in a in a, in a, in a baby. In other words, if, if it's a premature, my younger son was six weeks preemie, he's okay. But if it passed a certain time, they always worry about it. And they always worry about the lungs. So the lungs mature enough. Well, here's the problem with the maturity of the lungs. There are certain cells in the lungs that actually make what's called surfactant, like we talked about earlier before. Surfactant is a material, is a solution that covers the inside of those alveolus, which you all know, should know what an alveolus is, to keep the alveolus open. If they don't make the surfactant, the alveolus don't stay open. They, cl they cl close shut. So in this Highland membrane disease, the cells that make that, it means that they don't work. They're not, they're not mature enough. They have to be a certain level of maturity, fetal maturity, for them to start to make the surfactant. So when people, when a kid's a baby has, uh, uh, is, too, is very premature and they're worried about their lungs, they're worried about this Highland membrane disease simply because what happens is they can't keep those uh, alveoli open. So they have to put a person, the baby on the respirator to be able to allow these alveoli to stay open by the pressure of the machine. Actually, it's not a respirator, it's a ventilator. Ventilator is mechanically opening these things. So that's the problem with highland membrane disease. This means the lungs are not mature, they're not making a surfactant, the alveoli can't stay open, they clutch it close shut, so I have to stick them on a ventilator to keep those things open. Hydrocephalus, we don't see a whole lot now, but hydrocephalus is, we have fluid that's created inside the brain called cerebral spinal fluid. That when they do a spinal tap, it surround, this fluid surrounds the brain and also goes down along the spinal cord. And what happens is sometimes when they do a when they, or not or sometimes when they do a spinal tap, they actually stick a needle in this little gap between the spinal cord and some of these membranes and draw that fluid out. What happens in some babies? These the, the, the fluid is made inside the brain, not on the outside, but inside in containers. They're called ventricles. We have a lateral ventricle here, lateral ventricle here. It drains to one in the middle called the third ventricle, which drains to one below that, which is called the fourth ventricle. And from the fourth ventricle, it goes through channels to, to surround the brain. Sometimes these channels don't form. And when they don't form, that what happens is in those situations, um, the fluid collects inside these ventricles and then the brain starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Not because the brain so much is swelling, but because these containers, these ventricles, just fill with more and more cerebral spinal fluid. It presses the baby's brain against the skull, which then causes things like mental retardation. We don't see it that much now. Why? Because it's recognized exceptionally early. They could even ha it could even have hints of it when they look at a fetal ultrasound. And what they're able to do is they're able to put a shunt. They put a tube in the ventricles and run it down either into the jugular vein in the neck or sometimes all the way down even into the peritoneal cavity in the abdomen to drain that fluid. Okay, And it prevents the mental retardation and the other stuff that occurs. Meconium aspiration syndrome. What happens is the baby sometimes in what's called fetal distress. When the baby is having some type of distress, uh, uh, difficult pregnancy, difficult delivery, or long delivery, or whatever the case would be. Sometimes the baby says, you know what, I gotta go to the bathroom, I'm gonna do it now. And what they do is they have a bowel movement inside the uterus, inside the amniotic sac. Well, guess what? It's not like, you know, like outside, like the dog, or you know, it's not a thing like that. Because what do they have in the GI tract? Nothing, it's basically dead cells and stuff like that. They haven't eaten. So there's really nothing for them to eliminate that way. But what happens is this first bowel movement is called meconium. And meconium looks thick like molasses. It's a thick, black, tarry material. Okay, I've even seen people who have collected their first baby's bowel movement and put it in like a, a baggie and kept the baggie for their first bowel movement, which is called the, and the first 
first first bowel movement is called meconium stool. Okay, what happens if the baby's under fetal distress? They have a bowel movement before they're delivered, and as a result, the amniotic fluid instead of being clear like a clear uh, like a light urine, a very light yellowish color, it comes out more brownish, which then means that sometimes the baby may aspirate some of this material, which means they swallow it and gets in their lungs. They have to be sucked out a little bit. So that's what the meconium aspiration syndrome is. Pyloric stenosis, we talked about this in the GI tract uh, situation. In a baby, sometimes that area that, where the stomach empties into the into the duodenum, that pylorus, is too narrow. And, and it's tight. The, the sphincter, remember sphincter? The sphincter around that area is tight and spasm. It goes down. It collects down. So what happens, they keep on feeding the baby and feeding the baby and feeding the baby and feeding the baby and feeding the baby. And, the baby. and what happens is the, the stomach gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it can't take it anymore. And all of a sudden, it comes out like a hose. And that's called pyloric stenosis. A lot of kids will outgrow this. You feed them smaller amounts more regularly and they'll all grow it as they get bigger or if it can't be they just go in and make a little small cut they go in they they slit the muscle a little bit to oh, to loot to relax the sphincter open it up a little bit stretch it out and it's and it's, it's okay after that then it's called pyloric stenosis uh, this is that APGAR. They look at the heart rate, the respiratory effort, the muscle tone, the reflex irritability, and the color, and they give them a score. Zero means it's absent. Uh, one means it's it's, and, and they have the what the what the what the area would be here as how you get a one score, and this would be a two score. And then over over on the far right, you actually see a number. Okay, most kids when they're born don't have a ten at that one minute. It's ne almost never a ten. It's usually a six, maybe a seven. Okay, uh, most kids will their hands. And their feet will be bluish for a while. And it's called acrocyanosis, perfectly normal. That will go away. That clears, okay? And then what they do is they do it at, at one minute and, and at, at five minutes. And look at the score. The lower the score, the more likely the problem is the kid, there's all kinds of problems with the kid, and they're more likely to be re resuscitated. So that's what the APGAR, APGAR score is. This is a Down syndrome, okay? And again, uh, I think it's important to look at the thing on the right. It says wide range of development delays and physical disabilities caused by genetic disorder. Um, uh, I've known a lot of kids with Down syndrome. I actually work with a uh, with a uh, uh, adapted football league through the Cleveland Browns and the. Uh, 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 through a Camp Cheerful, okay? I've done that for a number of summers now. And we have a lot of kids there with Down syndrome. And these kids could be exceptionally lovable kids. Uh, and the, the level of both physical and mental abilities are fine. Uh, the kids in high school have gone through high school and they're ready to do other things in their life. Um, so there's a wide range of level of uh, both physical and mental abilities. If I look up at the top, you see, that's a chromosomal pattern. They've gone through all the 23 pairs of chromosomes. You see it on the bottom. This That would be a female. And and why? Because it says X and it says Y. And there's no Y chromosome, but there's two X. If a chromosome is XX, if the 23rd chromosome is XX, it's a female. If the 23rd chromosome is an XY, it's a male. Uh, but if we look at the 21, oh, there's an extra one. And that's what we saw, that 21 trisomy. There's three chromosomes for the 21st chromosome instead of two. And that's what they see with Down syndrome. Okay. This is that is erythroblastosis vitalis, a lot of small things. You could actually stop the video and read about it if you want. Here's the RH negative mother, RH positive baby, and stuff like that, like we talked about. That's what this diagram shows. This is that hydrocephalus, okay? And if you look at the picture on the right, uh, you see the gray area, that crosshatch area? Those are the areas of the ventricles in the brain. And again, what happens if they don't drain, okay? The, the brain increases. If you look at the kid down on in the picture, uh, look at that head. I mean, it's a huge alien-looking head. And it's and and the thing is, it's not that that's a brain size, but the, all the ventricles are so full of the cerebral spinal fluid that the head has expanded, and it does cause mental retardation and other stuff. And in this situation, the diagram, they actually put what's called a shunt. There'll be a little siphon that they put on the side. And actually, what they can do is they siphon the fluid out of the ventricles and then run it underneath the skin and empty it into the area of the peritoneal cavity, the abdominal cavity and get rid of the extra fluid, okay? So that's called hydrocephalus. Uh, this is that pyloric sphincter where that area, this is the end of the stomach, and you can see how it's pinched in the little baby. Look a little, they should look a little angry too, okay? But anyway, that's where it's pinched, and that causes increased pressure in the stomach, and that's when they, that projectile vomiting occurs, okay? And that's called a pyloric stenosis, okay? Couple pathological terms, a pap smear, Pap smear, we know, is that we talked about, is to look for cervical cancer, okay? And it should be done like every year, every other year on female, uh, you know, starting with uh, reproductive years on, on down. Pregnancy tests we talked about before, and that's a situation where we actually have a, uh, uh, 
uh, looking for a human chorionic anatrope in, in the urine or in the blood. Histrial cell pingography. What happens is they could take a tube, stick it up in the uterus, and pass uh, dye, into, fill the uterine cavity, and then also pass it out through the through the fallopian tubes to see how the fallopian tubes fill to see if they're open. And that's called histrial cell pingography. I'll show you a picture of that. Mammography we talked about is being a test to look for breast cancer. Uh, breast ultrasound imaging too. What happens they can also do ultrasound of the breast and looking for areas which are either solid nodules or hollow nodules. Hollow would be cysts inside, there'd be fluid inside. If it's a cystic nodule, it's less likely to be cancer. Okay, and that's that. We can also do breast MRIs, they can do MRI tests looking at the breast, and then pelvic ultrasonography. Again, that's looking for where the where the products of conception are, such as an ectopic pregnancy. They could do a, a, a look at the fallopian tubes to see if there's a, a, an embryo growing in the fallopian tube, or if there's something growing inside the uterus, as well as look at the uh, the, the, the the embryo as well as the fetus as it's growing. And if you've ever seen some of these new 3D, uh, they're not really new 3D ultrasounds. I got both of my grandkids. They're actually sort of freaky because you look it's like you crawled inside there with a little you know um, a camera you know and took a picture of them because it looks a lot like the kid when they finally get when they're finally born so this is that histrial cell pingography basically this picture here you can actually see the tube coming up and that's coming through the vagina and into that cervical os and what they do is then they put the dye in there and the dye fills that triangular shaped upside you know the triangular upside down triangle thing that's the inside of the uterine cavity and you can look at the dye on both sides of that and that's the dye that's actually come out through the fallopian tubes to show that the fallopian tubes are open people who have infections in the fallopian tubes the fallopian tubes frequently get scarred down Okay. This is a, a breast, a digital mammogram, and they're looking at the breast tissue. Again, they squish the breast tissue between two plates and take an x-ray. And they take them digitally because what happens, they could change the contrast, and they could change the, the, the um, they could uh, sharpness and stuff like that you know, of, of the breast to be able to look for uh, lesions a lot better. This is just a breast MRI, and that's just looking at the breast. I don't really talk much about it. And it's just a fetal ultrasound. This is just looking at a, at a baby inside the uterine cavity. You can see his little smiling jaw right there, and you can see his little back and skull, and you can see part of the femur and the leg. You see the, the chest and the abdomen sitting in there. And they can look for all kinds of things. They can measure, uh, they can actually determine gestational age by looking and measuring the lengths of their certain body parts. They can look at the head circumference or the, or the or you know, or, or crown to rump, top of the leg to the bottom, or top of the head to the bottom of the, of the butt. Uh, and these could all be plugged into charts to look for various abnormalities. So you can actually see a lot. You'll actually see on a funeral ultrasound the heart beating away and stuff like that. So it's actually pretty cool if you ever get a chance to see an up live and personal fetal ultrasound. Okay, a couple pathological terms, aspiration. Aspiration just means to suck something out. And if they, if they suck something out, it's called aspiration. Cauterization is just a term which is not specific for this, but just means to, um, to burn or freeze something off, okay? It's mostly a burning type thing. Uh, when they have that uh, abnormal pap smear and they have abnormal cells in the cervix, they could go in with a little electric spark and burn it, and that's called cauterization. Colposcopy, colpo means vagina. Scopy means to look at with a scope. If they want to look close at the cervix, instead of just putting the speculum in and taking, you know, a visual image, they could actually have a scope that they could insert inside the vagina, which has, which is lighted and magnified, so they could actually look at the cervix up closer to be able to see if there's any abnormal areas that might be, might be. Um, uh, cancerous appearing. Colonization. If somebody has a, a positive a pap test, pap smear, and they actually show abnormal cells that are up that canal, what they actually do is they go in uh, surgically and take a cone-shaped plug of tissue right from the cervix. I'll show you an image of that. They take that right out and that's called colonization because it's like taking out a little ice cream cone-shaped plug of tissue from the area where the cancer would be. Cryosurgery is just like cauterization, but instead of using heat or electricity, it uses cold. Coldocentesis, the cul-de-sac be between the rectum and the uterus, if they think there's pus in there or blood, they can actually move the cervix out of the way, stick a needle back in there, and suck out the um, uh, the, the material, the, the whatever fluids inside that cul-de-sac just to see what it is, and that's called a caldocentesis. Dilation or dilatation and curatage. What happens is if there's abnormal bleeding or if there's a, a, an incomplete abortion, in other words, where somebody has a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage and there's still parts left, what they could actually go in if that, or if there's abnormal bleeding, uterine bleeding, they go in and they actually open up the cervical os, which is called the dilation. They take rods of 
progressively increase size and they stretch out the opening of that cervical os. Once they get open, they could stick a tube inside there or a scraper and scrape the inside lining, all that endometrial tissue off. And that's what's called curatage. It used to be a curate, which used to be like an ice cream scoop with like a, a knife-like uh, edges on the nice, on the ice cream scoop. And they just, just scrape, 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 like you're scraping out the inside of a, you know, like a, a melon or something like that. Okay. And then what happens is they do that. But nowadays they just go in with a tube that's on suction and they run it along the inside. It has a little cutting edge and they just suck that all out. Okay. Laparoscopy is basically putting in three tubes in the abdomen, one to look at, one to do some uh, instrument to be able to do stuff, and the other one to fill the and abdomen with gas, like we talked about with the abdomen. And they could do a lot of things such as ectopic pregnancies and things like that through a laparoscope. Okay. And this basically is looking at the colposcope from the top. Again, somewhere where they're able to magnify the area of the vagina, where they're able to 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 look inside there, they could actually get closer up into the area of the cervix to be able to take a closer peek. You know, this is that what I told about a cone. Again, that area up on the upper right would be the area where the cervix is. That little dot in the center of where that dotted line is would be that cervical os or the opening. All they do is they just, under anesthesia, they just take a little cone-shaped piece of tissue, pull it out, and they test that to make sure that they got all the edges of the cancer with that. And that cervical os will regenerate, okay, or that cervical canal, endocervical canal within the cervical endo within cervical canal okay this is that caldocentesis again if we look at that green area back in there that would be like pus or something like that to be sitting there they move the area of the cervix out of the way with some forceps and just go with a needle in there and then take some suck some fluid out just to see what's there that's called caldocentesis this is that dnc this is the old way they used to use with a, a curette and that little that little tube on the right is a curette and the edge of that was like a little scoop and they just scrape it out nowadays again they use a suction to go in there and suck it out and there's a little opening on the suction tube okay on the side of it that has a sharp edge and just run along the wall of the uterus and just suck out all the tissue but on the left and the lower left that's where they actually try to stretch out that cervical that endocervical canal so they could get that um that um uh, uh, curette up in there okay a couple uh, pathological terms tests and procedures tubal ligation it's tying the tubes uh, if i can't get the ovum to the spermatozoa and i can't get the spermatozoa to the ovum what they get it's it, there's no pregnancy so what they do is they're able to go and find the fallopian tubes and tie it tie it cut between and separates therefore the ovum can only go so far the spermatozoa can only go so far and they can never meet Therefore, no pregnancy. Amniocentesis is again when they 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 could take a needle, stick it through the abdominal wall, and stick it into the amniotic sac, suck out the fluid. And by sucking out the fluid, they're able to look at various uh, fetal cells that are floating around in that fluid to look for various abnormalities. Cesarean section. Cesarean section is just delivery that's actually through the abdominal wall. That instead of having a vaginal delivery. Okay, what happens is they actually make an incision, a surgical incision through the abdominal wall and deliver the baby through the abdominal wall and then they have to close up the uterus. They used to think that if somebody had a, fetus, had a cesarean section, they would always have a cesarean section. Not true. Sometimes they could still have, but usually the reason why they have a cesarean section is because the outlet for the baby's head is too small. And as a result, they could push and push and push all they want, but the baby's head's going to be stopped by the bone. That's not going to go. Chorionic villus sampling. Again, they could look at some of the genetic characteristics of the um, of the uh, embryo by actually going inside the uterus, seeing where that little area where the where the uh, embryo is attached to the wall, and taking a little sample of the tissue from the chorion to look for genetic abnormalities. Fetal monitoring. As the babies come down the birth canal, guess what? It's going through a lot of changes. So what they do is they, they'll monitor the baby. They'll monitor its heart rate and things like that. Usually putting a monitor on top of the scalp. When they can see the scalp, they'll put a little, a little um, uh, electrode either in the scalp by a little curly Q wire or a little thing that will attach to the scalp. And they can monitor the baby's heart rate and stuff like that just to make sure that the baby's not going undergoing too much stress. Okay, In vitro, in vitro fertilization, sometimes what happens if there's a problem in getting pregnant, they could actually take the ovum, they could harvest the ovum from the female at the time of ovulation. They could harvest those, okay, and they could take those and they could mix, mix them with the dad's spermatozoa in a test tube okay or not not really a test tube these are test tube babies but it's basically in a plate okay in a little cup they'll mix these things and when they see that they're um that they're uh fertilized outside the body in vitro 
means outside the body. In vivo is inside the body. In vitro would be outside. They fertilize it outside. And then what they do is they take the fertilized ovum and they implant it inside the uterine cavity. And hopefully it takes. Usually what they do is they get as many ovum as they can, and as much sperm, and they try to get as many fertilized ovum as they can. And that way what happens, they know that when they implant, if they implanted five, they might be lucky to get one that will take. Okay, so the idea is they're not all going to be taken. Sometimes all of them are expelled. Sometimes they go through in vitro fertilization and nothing takes. Okay, but that's called in vitro fertilization. Pelvimetry. Pelvimetry is just measuring the size of the pelvis to make sure that when the babies come down the birth, birth canal, the canal is big enough for the baby's head. That's all that is. I can measure that by a number of different measures. This is what we talk about, tubal ligation, where what they've done here is they've actually gone in, they could cut the tubes, they put it, they tie the tubes either by a clip or by by, by suture material, usually by a clip now, because it's, it's much more reliable than the suture material, uh, which degenerates a little time sometimes, and then they just cut it in between. Therefore, the ovum could come one way up from the fimbria, and the spermazoa could come up through the uterus, but they can't meet because now there's a gap. And that's called tubal ligation. Ligate means to tie. Okay, this is that amniocentesis where they could actually go in with a, um, uh, a needle into the abdominal wall and take some fluid out of the amniotic sac just to see it. That look at the fetal cells that are floating around in that fluid. Look for any genetic abnormalities and things like that. This is that fetal monitoring where they attach a little bit of a monitor to the baby's head. Also, they could put a little uh, tube inside the uterus past the baby, and that will else also help to determine inside that the pressure that the baby is experiencing from the uterine contraction on the inside. And that's called fetal monitoring. This is in, pel in pelvimetry. Again, they could do it manually, or they could actually use it, and they could do it a number of different ways where they could measure the, the size of the pelvis. Okay, a uh, couple of abbreviations I'll tell you here. Let me just give you a couple. Let me just put them all up here at one time. They're all here, and you can all go over these. The ones I think you should probably know, I'll let you know real quick so I can get you out of here real quick. Uh, AB stands for abortion. Now, abortion doesn't mean, you know, coat hanger, um, uh, garage, uh, or anything like that. It just means when, any time, any time when a baby is lost before it's, it's ready is called an abortion and spontaneous abortion is the same as a miscarriage okay uh, alpha fetal protein is just a protein that could measure for various uh, various genetic abnormalities uh, um, let's see uh, uh, BSE breast self-exam might be a good one CA125 is that test I was mentioning earlier about ovarian cancer if a female has ovarian cancer they could do some tests one of them is called CA125 okay it's a marker it's a genetic or protein marker uh, it's also positive in other types of cancers but again it's not routinely done on everybody so that's not done as a screening test okay c-section cesarean section um, CIS I know it's carcinoma in situ which means in situ means that there's cancer cells but they're in a very small location they haven't spread that's carcinoma in situ in that site that's what that means uh, cesarean section CS that's a piece of okay some more here let me go Uh, uh, CX, I think I would remember, cervix. Uh, DNC, definitely, I think I would know that one. I think I would know that one. A DES, I don't know if you have to really know that, but I think it's important. Years ago, um, way before probably any of your, even your parents, probably more your grandparents, uh, females who used to have multiple um, miscarriages, they used to give them a drug called DES, diethylstilbestrol. And what happened, it worked. It got all these females, so they were able to carry a child to full term. The problem is, not so much at that point, but what it did to their female offspring, what they found was in female offspring of moms who had DELs, DES, to help their pregnancy along, to allow them to prevent those spontaneous miscarriages, the, the females, the female offspring, not on, uh, were known to have a higher than normal incidence of vaginal cancers. Okay, so that becomes a problem. Okay, so that's that was one of the problems with diastolestrol. Uh, EDC, I think, is one word I'd know. Uh, estimated date of confinement, which basically has to do with gestation, how long they're inside the uterus. Uh, let's go to these right here. And fill all these out. I'll tell you which one you know. Uh, fetal heart rate, that's pretty simple. FSH, we've talked about multiple times, and I think you should know fetal, follicle stimulating hormone. It's a commonly used one. GYN, definitely no. HCG, definitely no. Again, when you go to, uh, uh, when we finally get out and go into the stores and stuff like that, if, you know, hopefully 
uh, well, maybe, maybe, hopefully, maybe not, hopefully, someone looks for the home pregnancy test. And if you see him, and if you see it, and you'll see on the box it says testing for HCG, and HCG stands for human chorionic natropin, and we know where that comes from. I think I would know that. HRT, uh, HPV, we talked about before, the human papillomavirus, that might be a good one to know. HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Okay, got a couple more here. Uh, IUD. I would know that. IUD stands for intrauterine device. And these were all kinds of loops and uh, various materials that were actually inserted inside the uterus as a form of contraception. And basically the idea was, the the idea was the what was conceived about this, okay, it's a bad word to use conceived, but what was actually thought would happen was that it actually caused an environment inside the uterine cavity, cavity that wasn't very conducive to uh, allowing pregnancy to go. And that's what IVF, in vitro fertilization, I think I would know that one. Uh, LH, I think I would know that one. Luteinizing hormone, we already talked about that one. LMP, definitely know that one. LMP stands for last menstrual period. Again, when they when they look at someone who's pregnant, they look at what their last menstrual period is, and they can calculate when their estimated date of confinement will be, when that due date will be. The problem with that is, and the reason why it's frequently wrong, I have a story, but we're already way longer than I wanted to go. Um, but what we're, we're, um, uh, the, the mis mistake is sometimes, in that they, they look at their last menstrual period as actually wrong. Because what happens is sometimes they should be, they should say the last normal and complete menses. Sometimes, even after someone's pregnant, they get a small bleed after they're pregnant that they construe as being a menses, but it's not, okay? And so it actually puts them off one month. And they won't know that until they actually measure the size of the uterus, how high the uterus is getting in, or if they do, uh, an ultrasound. So anyway, that's uh, um, LMP, last menstrual period. OB obstetrics, that's an easy to know. What should you know in this list? The ones in here, uh, OCP, oral contraceptive pills, that's a pretty good one. Pap smear. Pap actually stands, like I mentioned, for Papa Nicolau. That's where that word comes from. So it's rather than say, I, I'm going for my Papa Nicolau smear, okay? Pap smear is a lot easier. Path pathology. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. I think that that one's important, okay? And I think this pretty much covers most of the abbreviations that I think are important for you. So now we've gone through all the female reproductive system. I've gone through, I've taken the PowerPoints that are on Blackboard and started to condense it to the stuff that, that's probably much more advantageous to you. And hopefully it all makes sense to you and everything will come together. A couple of things I wouldn't worry about either of those. Those aren't really important. Okay. Okay. Hopefully